Hi there. I, we are having our attendees are kind of shuffling in. So um, welcome. I'm Melissa Joy, and I am so pleased to be joined today by Alexa Kane. Alexa, can you wave? Um, <laughs> Hannah Neer, the newest member of the Pro Planning team, and Melissa Freidenberg um, from Pro Planning Gross Point, who also is kind of the quarterback in chief of putting these presentations together. So thanks in advance, Melissa, for making everything work so smoothly. We're so glad that you're joining us. And I know many of our viewers will be watching a replay. So thanks for taking the time to listen in. Today, we're going to be talking about the fourth quarter, kind of our investment outlook, but also where we have come from. Um, we're going to be focusing on not only investing, but also the economy, as well as um, the political landscape, there is potential for major changes in tax law in the new year. So that will be relevant to our conversation today as well. Um, so to frame our agenda, we'll start with the US economy and consumer, then talk about potential headwinds as well as inflation and Fed policy, uh, talk about the stock market as well as a little bit about bonds. And then um, what we don't know yet, what will tax law be as of the end of the year? We can discuss that as well as um, social security and um, how COVID has impacted it. And we'll have time for Q&A at the end. And I'd like to point out that there is a Q&A section. So we'll um, read off your questions. So if you have questions along the way, just um, put your questions in there and we will be um, revisiting those at the end. Um, Okay, so let's get started and talk about where we were. Um, and so even though 18 months or um, the beginning of COVID feels like it was a long time ago, um, it was only a year and a half ago. And we've really, in a very short period of time, gone through one of the most tremendous kind of disruptions of an, of an economy in modern history. And so I think it's good to frame the where we were as we talk about where we are going we had the worst quarter of GDP growth on record, um, something that is definitely noteworthy. I know we all felt it in our hearts and our daily lives. Also, um, the third worst quarter, quarter of um, earnings per share growth, um, huge dip in consumer confidence, as well as massive disruptions across the US economy. And then um, you cannot under calculate the impact of 20 million jobs lost in April, in one month in April of 2020. So you can remember back only briefly, and then, um, but then think about where we are today. So um, shockingly, if you don't look at the graphs, um, we really, the economic, uh, the economy recovered extremely quickly. Um, we've heard about a V-shaped economic recovery, but here you can actually see that V, um, the letter being spelled out. And in fact, now we are exceeding fourth quarter of 2019's economic activity. Um, corporate earnings as well are, um, when people ask me, why are stocks doing as well as they are doing? Um, even today, when the stock market is up significantly as of midday, um, earnings have a lot to do with that. So corporate earnings have recovered not only to pre-COVID levels, but past COVID levels. And um, people seem to be getting back to normal. Um, you know, we're not observing what people should be doing. We're just talking about what is happening and it's certainly measurable and marked. Um, so you're seeing a change in household net worth that is significant, not um, the least of um, one of the major reasons is because of equity prices as well as um, real estate prices. And um, this is one of the quickest starts to a bull market in history. It's still been very short in context of the long-term bull markets. Um, so that's something to note that typically a bull market is six or seven years, and we're just 18 months into this as of now. Um, so where do we go from here? Some people are noting that, you know, kind of the massive kind of upswing or recovery out of that V um, has already taken place, but in a market cycle, there's the potential to have many years or quarters of um, continued kind of positive or um, more constructive kind of gains in the economy. So worth noting, um, things that are still supportive include the Federal Reserve. Um, while they're discussing potentially 
um, buying less loans, which is called tapering, um, that has not begun to occur. Um, also, it seems that the if you looked at nationwide numbers, that the Delta variant is not as virulent in terms of um, increasing cases as it was um, a few weeks ago. And then um, if fiscal stimulus is set to decline, which there has been massive stimulus coming from the federal government, um, but there is still significant support from stimulus that um, remains you know, potentially occurring. And then things that are above average, you have earnings growth that really ripped through and to the positive, um, but still seems um, like there is potential for further earnings growth. GDP growth expe expectations, according to the Federal Reserve and economists, continue to be higher. Um, it, actually, next year's forecasts are much higher than where our growth rates were pre-COVID. Um, and then equity appreciation, um, while moderating, tends to kind of go with momentum. Um, and it's very difficult to forecast the returns of markets, um, but there's also not a forecast for lower returns. And then um, terrific news is that while we're feeling supply chain disruptions and we'll likely to continue to feel them into the fourth quarter, um, economies are very adaptive and those potentially will be easing in 2022 and 2023. Um, that should help with bottlenecks and also companies have very low supplies on hand of their goods and services or their goods. And so there's likely to be kind of re-inventorying that will be occurring. And then um, hopefully between the Delta variant and vaccinations, COVID is become and also um, adaptations of the modern um, of modern medicine in order to treat COVID. Um, COVID hopefully will be a less um, virulent interference in our lives going forward. And thinking through um, COVID specifically, we are going into potentially using new words that we did not use more than 18 months ago from a pandemic to endemic, more like a flu in terms of treatment. Um, the population that has both been infected, whether vaccinated or unvaccinated, as well as the vaccinated and uninfected population has continued to grow. Um, which hopefully, according to um, biotechnology researchers and doctors, should help with the ability to deal with the disruptions of this virus in our economy. And um, finally, the US economy is um, very resilient or has been resilient. With each peak in COVID, the impact on the economy has been less. So we can measure that both by mobility statistics as measured by Google, as well as um, the confidence of the consumer during the waves, which you can see in the middle chart. And then um, finally spending reaching higher levels than pre-COVID with this last Delta wave. Um, so all of this is a measure of economic activity and there is less sensitivity to COVID in the economic environment um, with each wave. Hopefully we're talking about lesser waves going forward or no waves, um, but that economic information is very important for us to understand as we evaluate what could be next for markets, as well as importantly, our you know, main street and the economy. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Melissa Freidenberg. Melissa, thanks for putting this all together and um, the microphone is over to you. Hopefully it is. Yes, um, thank you so much. And Melissa just shared um, a lot to be optimistic about when it comes to the economy. And I'm actually gonna share a few things that we just wanna keep an eye on that could have potential headwinds uh, as we move forward here. So those are fis the fiscal cliff, supply chain, the health of the consumer, inflation, and oil prices. So the first one, um, there are concerns that the economy is going to struggle because of the dramatic reduction in fiscal spending that we're going to see um, over the next year. So this year, we have um, 2.3 approximately trillion dollars in spending, and that's gonna drop down to in 2022 to about 450 billion. So still a high number, but that idea, um, when you hear the term fiscal cliff, is that we are going to see a slowdown in that spending, which could have a drag on our economic growth. Now, 
we're not concerned about this because this is something that was anticipated. This was not meant to be long-term. The fiscal spending was meant to get us over that um, period of slowdown from COVID and it has done that. Uh, in addition, we have had this in the past. If you look back to on the chart on the right is looking back at the Great Recession. So um, 2009, uh, moving forward, we had 18 consecutive quarters of um, lower fiscal spending. And not only did we not have a recession, but we also had positive GDP growth over that period. In addition, we do expect by the end of the year to have an additional $2 trillion package signed um, for fiscal spending, but it's important to keep in mind that that is gonna be over a 10 year period. So um, something to look at, it, it could have an effect on um, growth, but we are not too concerned about this at this time. Now, if you have turned on the news at all in the last few weeks, you have probably seen images of all of the ships that have goods that they cannot unload in port outside of LA. So there are over 60 ships waiting to unload their goods. And in addition, we're having supply chain issues with trucking and transport and just getting these items on the shelves in stores. So this is certainly something that um, has and can continue to um, be something to look at as a potential to um, our economic growth. However, we are seeing um, uh, just this week, it was announced that they are going to increase hours at that port in LA to get these goods out. And then companies are also being um, creative, right? So even Costco and Target are now chartering their own ships. Uh, Tesla's talking about producing chips here in the US in order to um, deal with the supply chain. So we are optimistic that this should be cleared up um, by early 2022. Another thing we wanna keep an eye on is the consumer. So the consumer really has been the driver of this um, recovery. And we do continue to see the consumer being the driver of economic growth uh, going forward. Uh, some of the reasons for this is we have historic um, net worth. So with the record net worth, the continued improvement in the labor market, uh, rising wages, and overall elevated confidence, we do feel that this is going to remain supportive of consumer spending. We also have a record um, amount of job openings right now, which should continue to drive wages up. And as a result of this, we do see, especially when it comes to the upcoming holiday shopping um, in the fourth quarter this year, that we uh, should see the consumer be the driver of this uh, economic growth trend over the next 12 months. In fact, people are booking early for holiday vacations, and um, is it, it is expected that e-commerce will be up uh, 11 to 15% this holiday season over 2020. So um, that is good news there. Now with this, um, both the supply chain and this increase in demand for goods, um, pent up demand, if you will, we see that people are, again, not getting what they're looking to purchase. So whether it's a house or um, a new car, even a used car, I hear a lot about appliances and furniture. Um, <clears throat> this has also been driving up prices of these goods. So in a recent survey from Raymond James Investment Strategy, 87% of participants have seen this inflation um, in the cost of these goods that they cannot purchase at this time or are having trouble purchasing. The good news here is that, well, I would say the good news is that we are seeing um, consumers resisting these rising prices. And what that means in the same survey, 53% of those um, decided not to purchase the item because it was more expensive than expected. And the reason that's good news is because when we see inflation spiral out of control historically, that is when customers are willing to pay any price for goods, right? So the prices are going up and people are also willing to pay that price. If you have consumers that are resistant to that pricing and say, I'm either gonna wait until the price comes down or not buy this item, that should help to keep inflation in check. And on the next slide, we'll see that the Fed also agrees with me, <laughs> with us on our thoughts on inflation. They're forecasting for 2022 that inflation is gonna go from 3.7% this year down to 2.3% um, in 2022. And so that this uh, increase that we're seeing is in fact transitory. Um, and that would be good for the economy. But again, one thing that we do wanna keep an eye on to make sure that it does in fact go down. At the September FOMC meeting, um, in addition to inflation, uh, coming off of, oops, sorry, I'm still on that slide. <laughs> um, 
inflation coming off of that point where they're also forecasting that unemployment is going to drop by another 1% between this year and next, and um, GDP to remain above average at 3.8%, which would make 2021 um, and 2022 the strongest years since 1984 uh, for GDP growth. So we have this environment where we have strong GDP growth, uh, healthy unemployment levels, and lowering inflation, and that is provides a great backdrop for the financial markets. And if we look on the next slide here, so um, because of that and the um, notes from the September meeting, we do not feel that the Fed is going to raise rates until 2023. And the labor market is some of the reasons for that. Uh, the labor market is still recovering. We still are 7.4 million jobs short of the trend line pre-COVID. And again, on the right, you'll see that the Fed forecast, um, that low light blue line in the chart there shows their forecast for inflation, um, which is pretty high right now and coming off of that high, which will allow them more time before they um, start raising rates. And lastly, something to keep an eye on is oil prices. So if you've gone to the pump to fill up lately, you'll feel that in your pocket when you fill up. And in fact, um, year to date crude oil is up 60% and is back to its highest level since 2014. So this has been driven by, again, that um, strong economic growth that we've seen throughout the recovery. With the reopening of the economy, there is a strong demand and supply really hasn't um, increase to meet that demand. So that is why we're seeing the oil prices drive up. And if crude oil were to continue moving sustainably higher, this could be a major economic risk going forward. However, we do not feel that it, we were gonna continue to see over a long period of time, oil prices go up. Uh, in fact, we started off the year, we were right at that break even point where um, uh, there is you know, a break even incentive, if you will, for suppliers to increase their supply of oil. Right now we're about 25 to $30 over that price. So not only uh, is there a great incentive for uh, both US producers and OPEC to increase the supply of oil, but we're already seeing signs that they are doing so. So again, we do feel that that increase in supply will put down pressure on the price of oil and we should not see um, the situation with that some analysts are calling for where we have prolonged periods of extremely high oil prices. So um, with that, I am going to turn that over to Alexa to talk specifically about um, some of the areas of the market that we like right now. Yes, thanks, Melissa. So I get to talk about the equities markets. And even though we've had some volatility over the past couple of weeks, we're still very optimistic long term. Um, and just a reminder that pullbacks in the markets happen fairly often, and they're just a normal part of being an investor, so nothing to, to panic about. The first chart is what Melissa Joy mentioned earlier. Um, historically, bull markets last about six years, and we're very early in this current bull market, about a year and a half into that. So some room there. And then this second chart, I think, is really interesting. It goes back 1990 to 2020, and it has the average performance from January through the end of the year. So we just got through some <laughs> September, October volatility. And what the chart shows is from October 10th through December 31st, historically, the S&P has been up about 5% in that time period. And 87%, so 27 years out of 31, the S&P has been positive. So good news long-term and also seasonally for the equity markets. And then two reasons why we're positive on the equities are economic growth and earnings growth. So the GDP is expected to be about 3.3% in 2022. And that third line in the chart shows that when GDP is between 2 and 4%, the equity market's up about 12%, and it's positive 80% of the time. And then the second chart in dark blue, it shows earnings per share, and light blue is the S&P 500. So 
we can see they're <laughs> moving together most of the time. And we're expecting um, earnings per share growth for 2020, 20, 2022 <laughs> to be about 10%. So that should drive the equity markets higher as well. And then we are still favoring US over international. Uh, profitability ratios strongly favor the US um, over Europe, Japan, as well as the emerging markets. Um, US is just more efficient, more profitable, and more productive than these other markets. And when we look at the largest brands globally, uh, the top five are based in the US and 11 of the top 15 are also in the US. So we're very profitable and these large companies are doing business on our soil. So that's for US. And then as far as the sectors that we like, we are still um, cyclical over defensive. And these sectors listed, we think there's strong earnings potential going forward. Uh, Melissa Freidenberg talked about consumer discretionary. So <laughs> the holiday spending, we think that's gonna be high. And then, you know, people have a lot of pent up demand still, cars, furniture, all of that, that they are waiting to, to spend money. So we think <laughs> a lot coming in there communication services, streaming, 5G, that is not slowing down either. Um, right now, financials are the most attractively priced <laughs> sector, uh, but with rising rates and capital market activity, we see a lot of things coming in that area. And then with the infrastructure package and strong growth coming up, energy and industrials will likely see a good boost as well. And then I think every <laughs> quarter I talk about equities and why we like them, but just wanted to put a little reminder as to why we still like fixed income, even when it's low interest rate environment. So the chart on the bottom left shows the S&P in light blue, it has the the bottom five years since 1977. So I think most of us remember 2008, the early 2000s and how those markets hit us. Um, and then the dark blue shows the bonds, the worst five years there um, with the worst being not even down 5%. But the interesting one there is that third one is actually year to date this year. So about down one and a half percent, which is, you know, not talked about when in the grand scheme of things because the equity markets have done so well. Um, but it's not a, a surprising thing, but just to note that yes, the bonds can be up and down, but when they are down, it's not to the same degree as the stocks. And then the chart on the right shows that when the equities are down, historically, the bonds have been positive to help with that, that um, to offset the losses in those years. So we do still believe in the diversified portfolio and in having bonds as part of it. So we'll give it to Hannah to talk about taxes. Thanks so much, Alexa. Um, so we just wanted to make sure we included a few updates for everyone on the current house tax proposal that was released about a month ago. Um, so it is really important to note that this bill will likely be modified and adjusted, um, you know, in the upcoming weeks. We just wanted to highlight some of the potential changes just to assist you in your preparation. Um, and it is anticipated that a, de a deal will be reached in Washington by the end of this calendar year. Um, another important item to keep in mind is that many parts of this bill are proposed to go in effect on different dates. So once it is passed, quick action might be required. Um, so we're definitely going to keep you in the loop on that front. 
Okay, so for individual taxpayers, the top marginal tax rate is proposed to increase from 37% to 39.6%. And this is primarily going to impact folks whose taxable income exceeds $400,000 as a single filer or $450,000 as a joint filer. And this change is also proposed to go into effect for this upcoming tax year 2022. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how um, tax increases might impact the market. Um, these tax prices seen here are actually already priced into the market for the upcoming year um, on both the individual and the corporate level. So if we do see taxes increase higher than expected, it could potentially mean some additional negative volatility in the equity markets. However, if taxes do not increase as expected or um, at all, it could be a near-term upside catalyst for the equity markets. So just something to keep in mind there. Um, so moving on here, we did just want to um, call out some of the specific proposed changes included in the tax bill. Um, so we'll start here with individuals whose adjusted gross income exceeds $5 million. And for folks in this income range, it has been proposed that there would be an additional 3% surtax that you may be subject to. Um, as far as corporate tax goes, the proposal has suggested an increase from 21% to 25% um, for those corporate taxpayers. And then when it comes to dividends and long-term capital gains, the top tax rate has been proposed to increase from 20% up to 25%. Um, and with this particular change, we definitely want to keep in mind, this would actually go into effect retroactively on any sales made after September 13th of this year, 2021. Um, and this, again, just as a reminder, is one of those changes that would impact single filers earning more than 400000 and joint filers earning more than 450000 as far as estate taxes go, it has been proposed that the exemption um, be decreased down to 5.49 million, um, which is down from the current 11.8 million. And this proposed change would reverse Congress's decision back in 2017. In terms of additional changes that might impact um, the individual level, high income earners with retirement accounts totaling over $10 million um, might be prohibited from adding additional funds to their Roth or traditional IRAs. Um, as a caveat here, as the bill stands currently, these high income earners would still be able to make contributions to work plans such as 401ks, SEP IRAs, et cetera. Um, and along those same lines, it has been proposed that Roth IRA conversions and mega backdoor Roth conversions may no longer be allowed in future tax years. Um, so again, take all of this with a grain of salt. So far, it's just a proposed bill, um, and it will definitely be adjusted and tweaked in the upcoming weeks. And uh, we will definitely plan on keeping you updated as the legislation progresses in terms of its outcome and also how it might impact your plan. So with that, I'll pass it over to Melissa Joy. Well, thank you, Hannah. And we're so glad to have Hannah as a new addition to the team. She has a tax background, which is a great extra technical capability that we can add to our financial planning services. What I would mention too, is that we will be continuing to update you on proposed or actual tax law changes um, in the fourth quarter. So we are not expecting a slow end of the year and um, definitely have that. Um, we're ready to do the work as, as soon as we have a direction in terms of where we're going and already doing some planning things for the people that are likely to be impacted by the law. Um, another thing that's coming up is Social Security, pressure on Social Security. Um, we've certainly seen some reductions in payroll withholdings that go right back to those job losses that started in April of 2020. Um, and so I'm both seeing that um, in reporting and journalists um, in the news, as well as there are, um, you know, some um, 
campaigning about um, taking away social security, we still see that there think that there will likely be some adjustments to social security over time. Typically, if you're already receiving social security, those adjustments tend to be pushed down to younger generations. So they don't typically impact people um, as you're receiving social security, you like to delay it so that it's kind of a slow creep on um, younger generations. Um, but we also know that there is likelihood that payrolls will be picking up and continue to pick up. There are a ton of jobs that just need the right person to find them. Um, so those numbers um, in terms of um, collections on payroll are likely to bump back up over time. Also of note, um, after we had published this, or kind of put together this presentation, is that next year's Social Security will increase by 5.9% for those of you receiving it. So the cost of living adjustment is real when it comes to Social Security, might be forgotten since we've had low to no inflation more recently, so that we haven't seen those big boosts to Social Security. Although I know my retirees remind me um, that they also have funds um, withheld from Social Security for Medicare, so they don't always see that increase right in their pocketbook. Um, but it is noteworthy that Social Security is one of the things that receives a cost of living adjustment, which makes it um, incredibly valuable. So I want to show you a picture of the market in two pictures. And if you look at here, at, look at this. It's not an echocardiogram. It's not a, a measurement of your heartbeat. It's just a look over the last five years of the stock market every single day. So there are some up days and some down days, um, but it's really hard to suss out if you were to just look at this chart, um, what is going on in the market? And I think so many times we get into the headlines and the 24 hour news cycle, and this is how the market feels to us. It feels like there's a lot of doom and gloom and you know every day there's a report card, right? So you see what is going on in the market if you open up um, your local news or the Wall Street Journal, um, and you can kind of be left dizzy with more ability to focus on what might go wrong than what is actually happening. So keep in mind, this is five years, and um, the next chart is the same piece of information. It's just shown differently, um, which is um, the investing since October of 2016 in terms of the returns of the market. Um, so in fact, um, if you looked over the last five years, the market's up 100%, um, annual returns of 14.8%. And certainly past performance does not predict future returns. But I do love to tell that story and remind you in different ways that you can, um, you can really feel like this is happening when, in fact, as an investor, you have the opportunity to participate in this. And part of our job as financial planners and investment advisors is to help walk you through a process that will help you to be a participant in something like this or, or something that's the right fit for your mix of stocks and bonds um, so that you don't get left kind of in the dust with that dizzying day-to-day -day focus. Um, so keep it, keep your eyes on the long-term and when you need help refocusing on that long-term horizon, um, please keep us, in, um, you know, on, give us a call or send us an email because we're happy to talk through what we're seeing. We never say we predict the future, so I hope you don't take that from what we um, have to say, but in most cases, um, you know, um, more days than not, the market goes up. And when it doesn't, um, we have tools to help you manage through. So I want to, again, point people to our Q&A. Um, question, the questions are open, but I don't see any yet. And I'll just make a few housekeeping notes as we watch for those questions. Um, looking at um, our contact information, because we're happy to answer questions if you call our offices um, in Dexter and Gross Point as well as all of our email addresses are available and um, our location. Also, we are enhancing our information on social media. So follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, and we have a new Instagram account coming. And, um, and then um, our podcast is weekly. So Hannah and Melissa Freidenberg sat down recently and went over um, the new tax law and a nice 20 minute a down to earth conversation. So you could think through the things that are coming in the tax law. If you listen to that podcast, which was a great episode, um, our next upcoming events, I would point you if you're a charitable giver, we're doing a gift planning webinar as a guest at 
the Rudolph Steiner School of Ann Arbor next week, um, but that um, event is open to any attendee. So if you're interested in that, it's available and you can find it at pearlplan.com slash events. And most importantly, we are going to talk about the actionable steps that you may need to take between now and the end of the year in our November webinar. So we'll give it a little time. I um, would be shocked and surprised if the tech, new tax law had been sussed out in Washington um, in November. It's likely um, that it'll be later. Um, and But we will be talking through some of the actions that you may take or the adjustments that you may want to make um, in that presentation. So keep an eye on that as well as in our newsletters, we'll be talking about what to think about between now and the end of the year. Um, Melissa and Hannah and Alexa, any topics that you're talking about with clients or just kind of preview of what we might do if um, you know there's a change to the tax law? The one thing I've been thinking about is that if you have any money in a 401k that is after tax money, that money is eligible as of today to be in a Roth. Um, it's It would require a conversion um, and you would need to take into consideration costs, et cetera. But that after-tax money, not Roth money, but after-tax money does not grow tax-free. It's just the money that's in there that's tax-free when you take it out. And um, that could potentially be changed with a new law. But as of today, it can be deposited into a Roth account so that all of the growth is also tax-exempt. Um, I don't see any other questions. Anything else you would mention, um, Hannah or Alexa or Melissa? No, you took what I was gonna say, so. <laughs> Yeah, all good here. Yeah, and so um, the other thing to think about as you're anticipating, I think Hannah did a great job of emphasizing that Washington and um, New York and the Wall Street price in what is coming down the pipeline immediately. So it's it's the day that there's an announcement about a potential new law, not the day the new law goes into effect. So that is important to remember um, in terms of kind of outlook for the rest of the year. It's also really important to slice and dice what your actual circumstances will be, not just what you um, are hearing about, you know, potential increases. So we have the tools and the capability to talk to you about your specific tax bracket, which may, for some people, there's an extension of child tax credit, which would help people. So, um, and again, this is all theoretical and it kind of, there's a sausage factory that kind of has to um, convert things into a bill. So um, we will, we like to operate on the things that we can control. And oftentimes there's financial planning moves that you can make when there are changes, whether that's in the market or um, in the rules and laws. And so we will be very constructive in thinking through what particular um, opportunities or um, kind of defenses need to be done um, for the people who are affected, which is, is rarely just a blanket of every client. It's something where we go in and, um, you know, try to be specific to you and your circumstances. So thank you so much to everyone who attended. There will be a replay to this presentation. Great job, Alexa, Hannah, and Melissa. And we will see you at our next presentations um, next weekend in November. Thank you.